Do you recognize your purpose tonight? Are you living for that purpose? What I struggle with and the people that I counsel, what I see that they struggle with, a lot of times we get so locked into our own personal little bubble. All we think about is the immediate. What's going on with us? Our issues, our problem, our ego, our things that we forget the big picture. We are here to glorify God. We are here to spread his fame. I want to remind you of that tonight. I want to call you back to it. And I want us to, as we go through this passage of Scripture tonight, I want us to think about three questions about glorifying God that we should ask and that we should answer. If you brought your Bible tonight, I'm going to ask that you would open it to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 15. We are in a series entitled, A Night Like No Other. We're in a section of Scripture. It goes from John 13 all the way to John 17. It's a section of Scripture that's known usually by two titles. It's called the Upper Room Discourse or the Farewell Address. Jesus is in the final night of his earthly ministry. I cannot stress to you what a, enough what a solemn occasion this is. It's very serious. It's very solemn. Jesus, in in John chapter 13, we're told that he he knew that his hour had come. He was about to go to the cross. Knowing what was about to happen, he wanted to prepare the disciples. He had some very important things to tell them because he's leaving, but they're going to remain. They're going to be the instruments that God would use to glorify himself, to spread the gospel, to plant churches. So he wanted to prepare them to speak to them, but also to speak to all the disciples that would follow. In this upper room discourse, Jesus does some wonderful things and some hard things. He celebrates the Passover with the disciples. He's telling them, he said, I desire to celebrate this with you. He's telling them that he's the fulfillment of, of the Passover. The Passover in the Old Testament is called a type or a foreshadowing. It's something that's done in the Old Testament that would have its fulfillment in Jesus. The Passover that took place in Egypt had its fulfillment at Calvary. He celebrates the Passover with him. He institutes the Lord's Supper. He wants them to know there's a new covenant that's going to be established by my blood, a covenant of grace ratified by the blood of the Son. He tells them that through the Lord's Supper. He washes the disciples' feet. This is a symbolic act that we're to follow in spirit and in principle, an act of humility, the idea that we think more of others than we do of ourselves. We put our issues to the side and focus on what's going on with other people. He does those wonderful things, and he does something difficult. He says he's going to be betrayed, that it's one of them, and he identifies the culprit. Judas. When he's identified, Judas leaves. He goes out into a night that is as black as his heart. Then Jesus really begins to get intimate with the disciples. Now that they're in the the privacy of the genuine followers that Judas has gone, he begins to unburden himself. Tell them exactly what's going to happen. Give them instruction how they are to live and act in light of his departure. Well, in our passage tonight, John 15, it's in a section where Jesus teaches a parable, the parable of the vine. He's talking about the importance of abiding in him. We've got to abide, to continue, to dwell in Jesus. If we do not, we can accomplish nothing. We're still in that section of Scripture, but Jesus is using that concept of abide, that parable of the vine, as a platform to talk about our purpose. The purpose for our being, the reason that we are to abide, to accomplish things for Jesus, is so that we can glorify the Father. Now in verses 8 to 11 is where we're going to be tonight. Now that I've unpacked it, let me read them to us. We're going to focus on these four verses and ask three questions of them. Jesus says this, beginning in verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. 
As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together for a moment. Our Father, we come before you and we recognize that as disciples of Jesus that we have the responsibility, the obligation, the duty to glorify you. Everything we do in life is to call positive attention to the God that we know, the God that we serve, the God that we have a relationship with through Jesus. Lord, it is so easy for us to get diverted from that. It is so easy for us to forget our purpose and to focus on the wrong things. Bring us back tonight. Remind us, may the Holy Spirit impress this upon us, that our purpose, our reason for being here, is to glorify you. Lord, I ask tonight as I proclaim this word, you know I'm a bit tired. Lord, I pray that where I am inadequate, that your strength would be sufficient. Your word teaches us through Paul that power is manifested, made perfect in weakness. May it be so tonight. May the Holy Spirit bless this message. And Lord, may we leave here as a people understanding why we are here. Lord, hear these petitions now and do so through the name of Jesus. And I ask this, his name, amen. So three questions that we need to answer revolving around the, the glory of God. We're going to talk about the why, the how, and the what. Question number one, why should disciples glorify God? Why is that? What is the reason behind it? Well, I want to call your attention to verse 8. We're going to deal with it just uh, at a surface level right now, and then in point number two, we're going to look at it in a deeper way. Listen to what it says again. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. He says right here, it's implied there, that we as disciples of his, we as the followers of Jesus Christ, that we need to be dedicated to the glory of God. It should be preeminent. It should be a priority in our lives. Now, a question that comes up is why? Why should that be a priority? Why, in fact, should that be not a priority, but what? The priority of our lives. Well, I want to give you some reasons. Why should disciples glorify their God? I'm going to give you three reasons. Two of them are implied in the text. One of them is just right there, explicit. Why should we glorify God? Well, reason number one, glorifying God is our reason for existence. You exist because God allowed it. You are not here by chance. It is not a coincidence. It is not a random series of events that allowed you to be born. You are here because God willed it. You exist because it is a part of his plan. He knew you before you were born perfectly, and now after birth he still knows you perfectly. You have a reason for being here. You have a reason, a purpose on this earth. He allows you to exist. And the reason that you're here is to glorify Him. Understand something with me. According to Genesis 1 and 2, we are created in the image of God. We are unlike all other creation in that fact. We are made in His image. God didn't have to make us. God did not have to create. Creation was not a necessity. God was not uh, compelled to do it. God did it by choice, and he did it for a reason, so that we could have fellowship with him and so that we could glorify him. You and I are here. You and I exist to glorify God. That's why we should bring him glory. Another reason that disciples should glorify their God, 
Glorifying God is our purpose in salvation. Glorifying God is our purpose in salvation. We have to be so careful because oftentimes we have a man-centered view of salvation. We make salvation all about us. Even if we say it's by the work of, of Jesus on the cross, even if we get that part right, we have a tendency to speak about salvation in terms of what it does for us. We do, don't we? We say, well, I, I, I'm saved, so now I have a relationship with the Father. I'm saved, so now I have a place in heaven. All those things are true. All those things are good. But we have to be careful with something, that we just don't focus solely on that, that we understand a bigger picture there. God drew up the plan of salvation in eternity. God's Son, Jesus, accomplished it, and he accomplished it to bring God glory. You and I are saved to glorify him. How do we do that as Christians? See, you are a living representative of the Lord. Through Christ you claim to know the living and the true God. You're his living representative. As you go throughout this world, wherever you go, you're testifying about him, and you're either giving proper testimony of what he's like or improper testimony. When we give the proper testimony, we are glorifying him. We're saved. That's the purpose, to bring him glory, to celebrate who he is, to spread his fame in this world that he's created. Another reason that we glorify God, those two are implied by the text. Now we're going to look at one that's explicit there. Glorifying God gives authenticity to discipleship. Go back to verse 8 of our passage, the introductory verse. Jesus says, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. We're going to deal with that part about fruit bearing in the next point, but listen to the, the bookends. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Do you hear the big picture, the big theme that Jesus has in verse 8? When we glorify God, we validate our discipleship. When we glorify God, when we make it the priority of our lives to spread the celebrity and fame of God throughout this world, we're showing that we really have a relationship with him. We're showing that we are a genuine disciple. That we're not just giving lip service to the gospel. But we've had a real salvation experience. We are truly converted. We've really been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He says, if you want to show that you're my disciple, then bring glory to the Father. Boy, that is a searching thing, isn't it? Glorifying the Father shows who we really are. So why should disciples glorify our God? It's our reason for existence. God allowed us to be born to bring himself glory. It's the purpose of salvation. We are saved to bring him glory. It authenticates our discipleship. It shows that we really are disciples of his. Now let's move on. That's the first question, the why. Now let's deal with the second question, the how. As I talk about glorifying God. Some of you may be thinking, Brother Randy, you're on a mystical trip up here. You're talking about something that's not very tangible. Glorifying God. What does that look like? How do I do it? How do I accomplish it? Well, in verses 8 to 10 of our passage, Jesus gives us some tangible ways, some nuts and bolts things, some practical ways that we as disciples bring glory to the Father. He shares with us three that we're going to look at tonight. All of them involve becoming like him, becoming more and more Christ-like. So let's look at this together. The nuts and bolts. How should disciples glorify God? What is a tangible way, some tangible ways, that we glorify God? Well, first of all, we glorify God by having a Christ-like character. A Christ-like character. I want to call your attention to verse 8 again. He says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. 
so shall you be my disciples. Now, we dealt with the bookends of this verse, the beginning and the end. Look at the middle. That ye bear much fruit. A tangible way that we bring glory to the Father. That's our purpose, the purpose for our salvation, the purpose for our existence. A tangible way that we do it is by bearing fruit. So that brings up an important question. What does it mean to bear fruit? When Jesus says that you bear much fruit, what's he talking about? Well, we've discussed this before. We have a tendency to think about bearing fruit as being solely involving evangelism. We think that bearing fruit for the Lord is sharing the gospel, bringing somebody to Christ, discipling them. That's certainly a part of fruit bearing. But that's not the whole thing. That's not the and all, be all. Most commentators are agreed when Jesus talks about bearing fruit, especially in the gospel of John, he's talking about character that is like his. Now understand this with me. When you are born again, When you become a believer, when you hear the gospel, the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sins. You turn from those sins and you believe on Jesus. Jesus has a work to do in your life. Salvation is instant. We know that. But he's then about the business of reproducing his character in you. It's often called fruit in Scripture. Jesus calls it fruit right there, that you bear much fruit. Galatians 5 talks about what? The fruit of the Spirit. Philippians 1, one of the things that Paul prays for the church at Philippi in chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, are that you bear fruit like Jesus. What he's talking about here is a Christ-like character. What he's talking about is allowing the Lord Jesus to reproduce his character, his life in you. Now, how does that happen? Jesus does it. Jesus does the heavy lifting. He's the one that reproduces his character, his life in us. But we have a part in that. You know what our part is? Surrender. Submission. Letting the Lord Jesus do what he wants in our life. When we surrender to him, his character is reproduced in our life. When his character is reproduced in our life, it brings the Father glory. That's a tangible way. That we glorify God. Notice another way that we glorify God. We do it through not only a Christ-like character, but by Christ-like love. Look at verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Notice the progression that he's doing here. He says, okay, the Father's loved me, I've loved you. Now you go out and love. You continue. You abide in my love. To continue in the love of Jesus, to abide it means that you receive it and then you extend it to other people. A Christ-like love. Notice that word love right there. In the Greek language, there's, there's three words primarily used for love. There's agape, there's eros, and then there's uh, phileo. The one that Jesus uses right here in the Gospel of John is agape. Agape is, if you can say this, is the highest form of love. It refers to a sacrificial, selfless kind of love. It's the type of love that doesn't look at your needs but thinks about the needs of others. It's the type of love that thinks about the greater good. The Father loved Jesus that way and still does, by the way. Jesus loves us like that with agape love. We are to abide in that love. We are to receive it and we are to extend it. When we love people with the love of Christ like that, we bring glory to the Father. I think about how times have changed. If you read, there's accounts by the Romans about the early church. I think it's Tacitus that was one of the early writers, and then Pliny was another one that would write about the Christians. And they would condemn them. They would talk about Do you know what the early Christians were condemned for? They called them atheists. Isn't that odd? Because they didn't worship a plurality of gods. 
But one of the things that they always said about the Christians, they could condemn them for a lot of things, but there's one positive thing they always noted, how they love each other. I said it breaks my heart because I, are we really known for that now? I don't think so. Today, we're really known more what for kicking folks when they're down, for shooting our, our, our wounded, for political slogans. We're known more for those things than Christ-like love. The Father's not glorified in those things, but He is glorified through Christ-like love. We as disciples, we should be dedicated to glorifying God. We do it through that kind of love. Notice another way, another tangible way that we bring glory to Him, not only through a Christ-like character, not only through a Christ-like love, but see, thirdly, through Christ-like obedience. Look at verse 10 of our passage. Verse 10. He says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. He tells us right here another way that we bring glory to the Father is through obedience. We struggle with this. We struggle with this because of our sinful nature. We also struggle with this because we're Americans. We talked about this a little bit on Wednesday night. You know, we're rebels. We think that rebellion is a romantic thing. Uh, we idealize it. Rebellion is not a good thing. Trying to be independent of God is not a good thing. We bring Him glory. We show that we love Him through submission, through obedience to His commands. Notice what Jesus says there in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Then He, 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 just, he qualifies the way that we're supposed to keep these commandments. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments. He says, now you keep my commandments and you do it, you obey my commandments like I obey Daddy. How did Jesus obey his Father? Hmm? How did he do it? Well, first of all, he obeyed his Father continually. Continually. If you look at his life here on this earth, there was never a moment when he didn't obey the Father. Can we replicate that perfectly? Absolutely not. Only Jesus can obey the Father perfectly. But we should strive for continual obedience, to be consistent in it. We shouldn't just obey when things are going well. We shouldn't just obey when we want to. It should be a consistent, a faithful obedience, day in, day out. That's the way Jesus did. Not only should it be continual, it should be comprehensive in the way that we obey the commands of our Lord. Think about how the Lord Jesus obeyed. He didn't pick and choose how he would obey the Father. He didn't say, now, Father, this command is easy. I like this one. I'll do that. This one over here is hard. I really don't like it, so I won't do that. No, he was comprehensive in his obedience. He obeyed it all. And again, we can't replicate that perfectly. But we should strive. We should strive to follow the whole counsel of the Word of God. Another way that he obeyed his Father, it, it was celebratory. He rejoiced to obey his Father. It wasn't something that he did with grit teeth. It wasn't something that he did thinking, the Father's holding me back from happiness and joy. That's how we think, though, isn't it? He followed the Father with joy. Doing the Father's will gave him happiness and joy. We should think about obedience like that. So when we obey God, he's not preventing us from experiencing happiness and joy. He's not trying to hold us back. He's keeping us in peace. He's keeping us in safety. He's allowing us to experience true joy. So we should celebrate is we obey. When we have a Christ-like obedience like that, we bring glory to the Father. So thus far, we answered uh, two questions. Why should the disciples glorify God? Then we saw how 
the tangible ways, the nuts and bolts. Now, the third question, lastly, the what. What's the result when disciples glorify God? Look at verse 11, the last verse of our passage. Jesus says, These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. He said, I'm telling you these things because I want you to know joy. I want my joy to be in you and I want this joy that you have to be full. See, this is the result. This is the outcome when we make the priority of our lives the glory of the Father. The result, the outcome, uh, the fruit of this, whatever you want to call it, it's going to be joy. Now, what does Jesus mean when he talks about joy right there? He, he uses it twice in verse 11, so we know it's important. Well, a guy named John Piper, a Baptist pastor, he's preaching on this passage, and he defined Christian joy that Jesus spoke of here this way. Here, here's the definition. He says, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the Word and in the world. A good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit when we see Jesus in his glory. Jesus is telling us, if you want joy in your soul, if you want that, be dedicated to the glory of my Father. Now notice how he describes this joy, this good feeling in the soul that the Holy Spirit will produce. He tells us, first of all, that this can be an abiding joy, an abiding joy. He says, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. He tells us, if we are dedicated to the glory of God, spreading his fame, his celebrity throughout this world, if we are dedicated to that, then there is the true potential, there is the true possibility that we can have abiding, continual joy. Abiding, continual joy. He says that my joy might remain in you. He wants it to abide. It can remain in you. But why might it not remain in you? Maybe as I'm talking to you tonight and, and you're hearing about joy, you say, Christian joy, I don't have a lot of that. Why might that be? Well, is the glory of God the priority of your life. See, that's the hinge. That's the pivot. If you want that joy to abide, if you want it to remain in you what Jesus desires, what he wants to give you, then you've got to be dedicated to the Father's glory like he says. Folks, joy can abide. Joy can remain. Make the glory of God the priority of your life. Another thing that he tells us about this joy, not only is it an abiding joy, I, I love this. It's a bottomless joy. Look at the end of verse 11. He says, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Might be full. What does it mean to be full? Audience participation. Now, what's it mean to be full? Easy. I, we ain't talking about Greek. For once, Brother Andrew's not talking about Greek. Just simple. What, what's it mean to, to be full? Huh? Satisfied? Yeah. What's the opposite of being full? Empty. So he's saying here, if you're dedicated to the glory of God, if that's your priority, your joy won't run out. Your joy won't go empty. It'll be bottoms. I like bottomless stuff. What is it? Five guys, hamburgers, bottomless fries. Make you sick. Did you know if you go to Red Robin, y'all remember this, this is very important for life. If you go to Red Robin, not only do they have bottomless fries, if you get a milkshake, it is bottomless. Yep. I know where some folks are going this week. I'm a paid spokesperson for, no, just. 
Jesus says your joy can be like that. No run out. Be full. Be bottomless. I don't know about you. As I look around at the world, I need some bottomless joy. I need some joy that won't run out. Again, what's the pivot? What's the hinge? What's it hinge on? It's glorifying God, my priority. When glorifying the Father, spreading his fame, spreading his soul,